It's Fashion Month, and while the last round of presentations ready themselves in Paris, one notable figure from previous years is no longer on the scene. Halima Ada's inclusion as the first hijab-wearing model on a mainstream runway sent a message of diversity in 2017. Aden appeared on magazine covers, including British Vogue, and won major commercial contracts. Her inclusion, a major win for the fashion industry. As her career went from strength to strength, almost a year ago, she revealed it came at a huge cost. The trailblazing model announced she was quitting fashion, saying she felt the work had compromised her religious beliefs, noting she was unhappy with the way she was often styled. Her posts threw a boulder at the industry and the giants that had been applauding her rise as she spoke of being tokenized. Halima Arden will be joining us from her home in Minnesota. This is One on One. Halima, thank you so much for joining us. Now, it's been almost a year since the Instagram posts announcing your departure from the fashion industry. You're back, but doing things differently. Tell me about what you're focused on now. You know, staying true to myself since day one, I've always said, don't change yourself, change the game. So I'm so excited to be back into the world of fashion, but in a different capacity, not as a model, but as a designer. You've effectively removed yourself from the broader industry to focus on the modest space. Is that because you feel it's a safer environment? or because you feel like you'll have more creative control? It's amazing to come back and work with a brand that understands my faith and my beliefs and know for sure that I do not have to conform myself in order to have that partnership. And so 100%, I do think modest fashion is, of course, a much safer industry for Muslim models, for women who wear the hijab. Do you think it's possible to create a space that serves you and women like you in the mainstream? You know, I was in mainstream fashion for four years. I was Vogue's first hijab wearing model. Like that was a huge step towards the right direction in terms of inclusivity. But I also was having so many internal conflicts with how my hijab was being styled and shifted and it lost its identity. And I couldn't really, I couldn't really relate to the hijab towards the end of my career in fashion. So it was very important that I took a step back. And do you think you're in a different space spiritually maybe to where you were when you first started your career? I think so. I was 19 years old when I started. And Alhamdulillah, like I, I experienced so much and I've grown and matured and evolved. And so just like that, my hijab journey, you know, I'm so proud to say I've experienced it all from turban styles to more traditional styles to jilbab. And so now I'm going back to my traditional hijab, you know, the one that I identified the most with and that I know a lot of Muslim women around the world wear, and they need representation too, you know? So I'm so excited to show them that Halima is able to wear a traditional look and still be accepted in these spaces. I mean, a lot of Muslim women actually in the UK have told me that sometimes uh, they feel like they have to appear normal, whatever that, whatever that means. So they might refrain from wearing a more traditional or conservative style hijab in order to try and fit in and why the society almost frowns upon uh, certain looks. So, so can you relate to some of that? Oh, I can definitely relate to that. I think just like a lot of Muslim girls who, especially growing up in the West, I've definitely experienced moments where it was just easier to wear a hat in place of a hijab. And I don't know if it's because of Islamophobia and how prevalent that has become. And it's just easier to blend in to fit in. But there is nothing more powerful than owning your hijab, owning your identity, showing up into these spaces with whatever you're comfortable with. And so I would recommend to especially young Muslim girls, do not feel the need to conform and to change or, or to water down your hijab, like own it proudly and the right people will accept you. And how do you think you do that? Um, with a lot of young women often feeling this sort of pressure, how do you tackle that sort of pressure to fit in and, and, and conform to an A type? You know, it's hard. I'm not going to sit here and, and pretend that it's easy, but I will say it takes, you know, like just put yourself in the shoes of the next generation. If you're able to own your identity and own your hijab, 
it's going to be so much easier for the next generation of young hijab wearing women to look up to you and to know that, okay, she didn't conform. She's wearing her hijab proudly. So why can't I wear my hijab proudly? So I think it's also a matter of having the right role models and representatives that do wear the hijab. And I think it's easier for then young women to aspire to that and to know that they're not alone. How do you feel about that title almost, like being a role model? Uh, there's a lot of pressure that comes with that. It, it is a lot of pressure, but at the same time, even regardless of what platform I have, I would still want to be a good role model to my little nieces, to the young Somali girls here in Minnesota that look up to me. So it doesn't matter if it was 200 followers on Instagram or 2 million, you know, we all have a platform. And I think, you know, especially for me, like even regardless of my career, I would still try to be the best role model I could be to my little sisters, to my cousins, the little girls in my family. So I think now I just expanded my family. It's a global family. It's young Muslim women from all over the world, my little sisters that are looking up to me. So then it's, it becomes easier, you know, to be a, to be a role model. And, and do you have any role models that you look up to? I do. You know, my mother is my greatest aspiration. She is the reason why I started to wear the hijab in the first place. I look up to her so much, her resilience, her grace, the way she handles things, um, how she always reminds me to, to be steadfast when it comes to my hijab. So my mom is definitely my number one role model. Halima, while we've seen these headscar headscarves appear on the runway on models, on mannequins, uh, various bans remain in place in countries around the world on hijab, on niqab. And these are often in the context of counter extremism measures. Um, how does that make you feel as such a high profile, visibly Muslim woman? I mean, we have to ask the question, if a hijab, if a woman deciding to wear a head covering threatens French values, what does it say about the values to begin with? And I think it's absolutely ridiculous that women have to choose between their hijab and their career in countries like Germany, and that the highest court ruling actually allowed for employers to discriminate against women who wear the hijab. I think that is absolutely dangerous and divisive. And we're definitely headed towards a very dangerous path. And, and why do you think it is that the hijab stirs up so many tensions in, in Western liberal European democracies? What do you think it is? I don't understand the obsession. I do not understand the obsession of people trying to control what women wear. And it's absolutely ridiculous how society will shame a woman for showing skin and on, a, an, on the same breath, also shame women and call them oppressed when they do decide to cover up. So it's a lose-lose situation for women. And I think this, like, for example, the, the hijab ban in these European countries, it's not necessarily a violation for Muslim women only. I do think it's a violation for women's rights. This is no longer just for hijabis and non-hijabis. This is absolutely an attack on women's rights. And you've spoken previously about the gymnast, the German gymnast who protests and wore full-length leotards uh, during the Olympics and scenarios like that. So do you think all of those issues kind of interplay? I think 100%. The Olympian um, gymnast, that's one example. Kim Kardashian wearing a fully covered black uh, outfit to the Met, that's another example. So it's cool and trendy when fashion lets women cover up, but it's not cool when a hijab wearing Muslim woman wants to cover up. We get attacked and shamed and called oppressed. But as soon as it's on another woman that's not a, a Muslim woman, it's all of a sudden, wow, this is amazing. Like, this is your choice. It's just, to me, it's, it talks about the double standard. And do you think that's because it means something? Because when a Muslim woman wears a hijab, it's not just material covering her skin or her hair. It's material that stands for Islam. Exactly. Halima, you're a Muslim Somali black American woman. Uh, we've spoken about the early years of your life, uh, being born in the Kakuma refugee camp in Kenya. How do you think all of these different spaces have impacted your identity? You know, I'm a universal baby. You know, early on in my life, I was blessed to deal with some of the world's toughest issues in terms of being a refugee. And so having lived one extreme, extreme, extreme poverty and malnourishment, 
to then growing up and becoming the first hijab wearing woman in all these spaces like it's it's truly remarkable that in one lifetime i got to see extreme poverty and on the other hand also see extreme luxury extreme wealth and so it's definitely i think added to me and has helped me mature and be more of a global citizen knowing some of the issues that we're faced with you know i always try to incorporate that into the work that i do Liva, I know you're very passionate about charity work and the way things are run. Do you plan on maybe getting involved in, in more of this type of work? I'm doing my research and I'm finding the right collaborations. Yes. And is that because you think there needs to be a bit of a change? I know you've previously mentioned that, you know, from your experiences as, as a child in a refugee camp, that their, you know, exploitation is something that you've seen firsthand. Yeah, I mean, real activism doesn't have an act to it. And I think sometimes with these mega charities, there's that initiative to bring back a Western celebrity into these refugee camps. Let's photograph them with all these children that don't have shoes, that have tattered clothes. And for a very long time, that was the marketing strategies in order to garner donations. And I understand that, but I think it's time that we step away from that sort of marketing to help refugees and really invite refugee parents to the table, a seat at the table, because no decision should be made about refugees, affecting refugees without the refugees present. I full, wholeheartedly believe in that. Hey, in the varied experiences that you've had, what would you say to your younger self? I would say brace yourself. <laughs> I would say brace yourself because you're in for one heck of a journey. Lima Aden, thank you.